a group of helicopter pilots tried to fly an airplane and unfortunately things didn't go as they planned and they crashed about 40 minutes after takeoff. But the truth is there's a whole lot more to the story, including reckless mistakes, hazardous attitudes, and the shocking reason why they crashed. I'm Hoover and welcome to your pilot debrief. Our story begins on May 29th, 2012 at the North Las Vegas airport. Four helicopter pilots boarded a small single engine aircraft to go on a fishing trip to Bryce Canyon, Utah. Their first flight was relatively uneventful and they landed at the Mesquite Municipal Airport to get some fuel. They took off a few minutes later and were about 40 minutes into the second flight when they disappeared off radar and crashed without ever making any radio calls for help. Three of the men on the trip were 45 year old Todd Stutzner, 32 year old Paul Andrews and 31 year old Joshua Stubblefield. All three of these men were licensed commercial helicopter pilots, but they were also certified flight instructors on helicopters. Now we don't know much about their total flight time or experience they had flying in fixed wing aircraft because the NTSB consider them as passengers on the flight. However, there are three things that we know about these men for sure. First, they all worked for the same helicopter tour company in Las Vegas. Second, none of them were qualified to fly the aircraft. And third, they all trusted one man to keep them safe on this trip. Chris Spearsu was 44 years old and he was the pilot flying the aircraft. Chris was a commercial helicopter pilot and a flight instructor just like the other guys, and he worked with them in Las Vegas. However, in addition to flying helicopters, Chris also had a private pilot certificate for single engine airplanes, but he didn't really have a lot of experience flying fixed wing aircraft. In fact, he had over 5,400 hours flying helicopters, but only about 160 hours flying airplanes, and this is just one of the factors that's gonna play a role in this crash. Pay attention though, because you're about to see how the holes in the Swiss cheese are gonna start lining up. According to the investigation, Chris did all of his fixed wing pilot training flying a Cirrus SR-20 at a company called Elite Aviation based out of the North Las Vegas airport. After getting his private pilot certificate, he stopped flying the SR-20 and he switched to flying a Cirrus SR-22 from another facility at the same airport. The reason this is important is because if we fast forward about a year and a half later, when Chris was planning the fishing trip with the guys, he wanted to rent the SR-22, but it wasn't available because it was having some maintenance work done on it. So he had to go back to Elite Aviation to rent the SR-20. The most ironic thing about this is that Elite Aviation had the SR-20 aircraft for about five years on a leaseback agreement from its owner, and Chris just so happened to rent it for what was supposed to be the aircraft's very last flight before it was scheduled to be returned to the owner the following day. If you're not familiar with the SR-20 and the SR-22, they're both small single engine airplanes and one of the unique features of these aircraft is that they're both equipped with a parachute system called CAPS that the pilot can use in the event of an emergency such as an engine failure or an out of control situation as you can see in the video shown here. Two of the biggest differences between these aircraft is that the SR-20 has about 100 less horsepower than the SR-22 and the SR-20 max takeoff weight limit is about 500 pounds less than the SR-22. And Chris needed to take this into consideration when he rented the SR-20, but the only problem was that Chris hadn't flown an SR-20 in about a year and a half, and he only had about 17 hours as pilot in command of an SR-20, so it wasn't something that he really had a lot of experience flying. Even though Chris was qualified to fly both aircraft, I think he probably had a false sense of overconfidence because he had so many hours flying helicopters and maybe he also figured that the aircraft parachute would save him if he got in trouble. We also know that based on interviews with elite aviation personnel, Chris would always try to circumvent things with the female office receptionist, but not with any of the male office personnel. Also on one occasion, shortly after he got his private pilot certificate, he was seen overloading the aircraft and someone from Elite Aviation had to stop him and tell him that he couldn't take that much baggage. In my opinion, this is an example of an anti-authority attitude. If you haven't seen this list before, these are the five hazardous attitudes that are commonly found in aviation mishaps, and I'm sure we've all come across someone that displays at least one of these attitudes. The anti-authority attitude is found in pilots that think the rules don't apply to them, or they try to find ways around the rules, and we're gonna see more examples of these hazardous attitudes when we look at what happened on the day of the crash. But before we look at that, I just wanna mention a quick side note that one of the people the NTSB interviewed was Elite Aviation's chief flight instructor whose name was Eric Valente. 
Now, let me be clear. Eric had nothing to do with this tragedy, but if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because Eric was the flight instructor that died almost six years after this tragedy when he took off at night in an overloaded aircraft with a student pilot and a few Instagram models, and I explained everything that happened in that tragedy in this other video on my channel. Oddly enough, it turns out this wouldn't be the only strange coincidence I discovered in this story. On the morning of the accident, Chris showed up at the airport by himself almost three hours later than the start time of his rental period. The owner of Elite Aviation saw Chris and said that he seemed to be in a rush and he was doing things faster than normal. Now, I think this is a classic example of the impulsivity hazardous attitude that's common in aviation mishaps where we see pilots trying to rush things without taking the time to do a proper risk assessment. Rushing through your pre-flight might not seem like a big deal, but when you try to rush, that's usually when something gets overlooked. And if you get away with it a few times, then you start to think that nothing can go wrong until one day it does. The owner also said he thought Chris's actions were strange because Chris would normally load the passengers and baggage at Elite Aviation, but for some reason on the day of the crash, he jumped in the aircraft and taxied down the ramp to the terminal area where the people at Elite Aviation couldn't see him. Now this could have been a completely random decision, but it also could have been the anti-authority attitude because maybe Chris remembered getting caught overloading the aircraft once before and he didn't want to be seen loading up because he knew he was going to cram four grown men plus fishing gear in the aircraft and perhaps someone would have stopped him. The truth is that there was no evidence that Chris calculated their weight and balance, and the investigation determined that the aircraft was 210 pounds over its max gross weight limitation when they took off. Despite being overweight, the aircraft departed to the northeast and the flight to Mesquite Airport was relatively uneventful. By the way, if Mesquite Airport sounds familiar, it's because this is the same airport where a pilot crash landed a Cessna 550 Citation II that he was flying by himself when he was drunk. The whole conversation with air traffic control was recorded and I explained everything that happened in this other video I made about pilots flying drunk. We know from the interviews and fuel records that after Chris landed at Mesquite, he added 10 gallons of fuel and according to the airport manager, they seemed to be a little overloaded with four large men in fuel, but not being a pilot myself, I figure they must know what they're doing. Here's my advice. If something doesn't look right, say something. Don't assume that people know what they're doing. And I'm sure the manager regrets not saying anything. However, I also get the feeling that even if he had tried to warn them, it probably wouldn't have made a difference. And that's because in my opinion, that first flight set Chris up for disaster. When nothing bad happened when he took off, I think it gave Chris a false sense of confidence in the performance capability of the aircraft. And just because it might be possible for an aircraft to fly when it exceeds the max takeoff weight limitation, that doesn't mean it's a good idea. The rules and the limits are written in blood, and the problem is that if you push those limits and everything goes fine, then you don't think twice about doing it a second time, and eventually breaking the rules becomes routine. As they taxied out for takeoff, the aircraft was 225 pounds over the maximum takeoff weight limit. However, this was not going to be the reason why they crashed. While they were still on the ground in Mesquite, according to one witness, as they boarded the plane, I heard someone ask whose turn it was to take the front seat. And they saw Chris climb into the right seat and his friend Joshua climb into the front left seat. They were seen having trouble starting the aircraft, but after they got it running, they took off and did at least one touch and go before departing. This is a classic example of the invulnerable and the macho hazardous attitudes. Even though Chris can legally fly the aircraft from the right seat, that doesn't mean it's a good idea. There was no evidence that Chris had ever flown on the right seat of the SR-20 before, and my guess is that he was doing it because he wanted to let Joshua do the touch and go or some of the flying, and he wanted to show off the aircraft, and he probably figured nothing's going to go wrong, except this time it did. About two and a half minutes after they got airborne, the engine RPM decreased from 2450 to 2300 RPM, and this was a huge contributing factor to the crash. Now, the NTSB didn't offer any explanation for that reduced power setting, but we know that there was nothing mechanically wrong with the aircraft. So the only way the RPM could be reduced is if the pilot reduced it. Now, my guess is maybe Joshua moved it if he was the pilot doing the touch and go. Regardless, Chris never fixed it, and that's probably because he was relying on some of his habit patterns from flying helicopters. 
Now I'm gonna caveat this with the fact that I've never flown a helicopter, so please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is that in the Eurocopters that Chris was flying, you typically set the main rotor RPM and you forget it because the governor keeps it constant, so there's no need to make throttle adjustments in a helicopter, and that might explain why Chris never increased the SR20 RPM as they started heading towards the mountains. This is obviously gonna become a big problem because about 30 minutes after takeoff, as the aircraft is passing through 7,100 feet, they had rising terrain ahead of them going as high as 9,000 feet. They needed to climb faster, but at the reduced power setting of 2,300 RPM, the most they were gonna achieve was about 22 feet per minute. Unfortunately, instead of turning around and figuring out what's wrong, they made a reckless mistake and decided to fly up the canyon and they put themselves in a very bad position. You never want to point directly at terrain that's higher than you. Instead, you need to approach it from a 45 degree angle in order to give yourself a way out if you can't climb above it. And I think it's likely that Chris has never done any mountain flying in an airplane and he just doesn't even realize how dangerous this situation is. As he headed up the canyon, their best climb speed was 93 knots, but Chris was flying the aircraft at 73 knots. And that was a terrible decision because that was basically right at stall speed. Now the aircraft data revealed that the stall warning horn sounded almost continuously for three minutes and eight seconds as they kept pointing towards the ridgeline ahead of them. Just one of the problems with flying at the stall speed is that you're not generating any lift. And that means instead of climbing at 22 feet per minute, they weren't climbing at all. And as they went up the canyon, Chris kept pulling back on the controls until they exceeded the critical angle of attack and stalled. The shocking truth was that when Cirrus analyzed the data, they determined that based on the aircraft altitude, weight, and air temperature, the engine could produce 2,700 RPM. And if the aircraft was being flown at a best angle of climb airspeed of 93 knots, it would have had a climb capability of 375 feet per minute. That means despite being overweight and all the reckless mistakes and hazardous attitudes, if Chris had just used full power and flown the aircraft at 93 knots instead of 73 knots, then this crash probably never would have happened. The pilots never pulled the handle to deploy the parachute, probably because they didn't think to use it until it was too late and the aircraft crashed inverted and unfortunately everyone on board died in the crash. This was a very tragic story because these guys didn't hop in the aircraft planning to crash. However, they were all adults and as qualified flight instructors, they had enough experience to know that they were probably overweight and some of the stuff they were doing wasn't a good idea. You always need to ask yourself, is this dumb, dangerous, or different? And in this tragedy, I think it was a case of all three and it probably could have been avoided if just one person had the courage to speak up and say, no, this isn't right. Now, I hope you never find yourself in a situation like this, but if you do, I also hope you have the courage to speak up because you don't want to have any regrets. Thanks to everyone that sponsors me on Patreon and my YouTube channel members for helping make this content possible. Be sure to check out another video on the screen and I'll see you next time.